I always knew who I was. I, I, one thing is I absolutely was sure of who I was, my own identity, my sense of self. And uh, then I, I, I got a little bit of a surprise. But the first thing, it's, it started out in a, in a small way. I'm a, you know, I'm a white heterosexual male. My name is James Henry Fallon. And so I'm a WHM. And I'm also a Irish Sicilian American, so I'm a, a wish am. Uh, then when I was about 13, I found out that was not my real name. It was not James Henry Fallon, which I, I think I had made up, but James Harry Fallon. And um, also, we were not uh, Irish at all, but we were adopted. So we were adopted. We're really English genetically, if you will. And so uh, here's really what I am. I'm a white English, a Sicilian American heterosexual male, middle class, agnostic, brought up Catholic boy, uh, booing uh, libertarian New York, transplant to California, married Angels, Ducks, Chargers fan. So I'm a Wesham, a Maka, Buka, that thing. OK. And so. And that was, that, was, that was fun to find out. You know, this was, uh, it was just part of a parlor game that everybody has gone through. And, uh, you know, and, and I had a pretty standard youth. I was considered myself to have a standard youth. Uh, I was, ended up being class clown in high school. I was always goofing around. I was more angel than devil. Uh, and, and I also was named Catholic Boy of the Year, in the capital of New York. And, and that, for some reason, afforded me the honor of meeting Nelson Rockefeller. I don't know what the two have to do with each other, but it was a, it was a fun thing. He didn't do that to me. He was, it was a, he was a great guy. That was a kid. So, I I I, I did some uh, you know involved with some other things too, and I was involved with a lot of extreme sports and everything, but pretty normal stuff, really regular stuff. And I've been married since Nixon, and here's my wife. And we uh, started dating when we were 12. We were first dates, and we loved to dance together and swim. So we really got along. We became friends. I mean, knew nothing about romance and certainly not sex. And, for, and then we were about 16, we were just wrestling uh, downstairs, and we just started making out. It was like, oh, it was this. You know, it was like, the, all of a sudden, the hormones hit. <laughs> and so we started to go out, and so we said, hey, I think we like each other. We really like each other. And we ended up getting married. So we've got uh, three kids who are in their 40s and, and five grandkids now so far, the oldest of whom is, is uh, 18. And this kind of jumps, jumps up at you. I've been a professor at UC Irvine since 1960, 1978. So I'm kind of a potted plant there. I'm still there. But I've really had a stable family life. And I've had a very stable professional life. And, and I really always uh, considered myself um, very quite, quite normal. And uh, so I, I retired at 62 from all the administrative work at the university and my formal teaching. I still teach and do stuff, you know, but I mostly do research, but I'm my own graduate student now. I'm just having fun. I don't need to do anything for money, so it's great, you know, it's, so it's, uh, it's where, you wanna, where you wanna be. So I'm happy, successful, and I'm a self-diagnosed normal guy. Now, and then something happened, okay? Now, I, I think I'm partially, I'm partially responsible for, this is the first time Gandalf showed up, and, and, and it turned out to be me, in a sense. And so uh, what I had been doing since the early 90s, we got a PET scan, a positron emission tomography. And one of the things we were doing was these really bad, these serial killers, bad murderers would come in. And then during the penalty phase of the trial, they'd, they'd say, OK, I'll get a PET scan. And then you can tell me that I'm crazy, so I don't get the death penalty. And so we had done that one or two a year. And it was thrilling for the, for the medical students because they bring these guys in the manacles and shackles into the PET scanner, SWAT team on top of the medical school buildings. Uh, the, the dean and the chancellor love this, of course. Uh, and, but this went on for a number of years. And other people were sending me different kinds of scans. So uh, I was looking at different scans of murders. But I told them, don't tell me who's who. I wanted to do it all blind. Because you know, even when you try, you create a narrative in your head of the way things should be. I said, don't tell me even if they're killers or anything. So I got a whole bunch of these in 2005. And uh, when I was looking at them, I realized it was a pattern. And I'm not an expert in psychopathy or in, in murders or anything else. It's just one of the things you do when you're a neuroanatomist, like patterns, so people send you this stuff. And that's my, my computer game. It always has been. And I noticed this pattern. And the pattern was that in all the psychopaths, the, uh, the area of the brain that's called the limbic system, it's part of the social brain and emotional regulation, that it was turned off in all these guys. So I, said, so I you know, I just kind of put together a theory and kind of vetted it at, at different psychiatry departments, law schools, and everything, just to kind of move it around. And that was 2005. So I had this 
this, uh, you know, this theory. And then we just happen to be doing, we're looking for the genes associated with Alzheimer's. Because we know the APOE, but we thought there would, might be a gene that would interact with it, that would really uh, uh, cause trouble for people who had these, these genetics. And so we needed some normals. So I got some controls, and I was one of the controls, because we had to get the study done. We had all the Alzheimer's patients. And so what we uh, ended up with is all the controls looked like controls. So it was great, except one, I looked at the PET scan, and I told the uh, technician, I said, you've got to go check the scanner, because this is obviously one of the killers. Because it looked like the worst of the psychopaths that I had looked at ever. And they went and checked the machine twice and everything, the whole providence of the, the data. They go, no, it's somebody in that group. So I had to peel back the name. I said, this, somebody's running loose who's a control. And it's a murderer. And, I, and of course, I peeled and then, and the name on it was mine. And, <laughs> and you know, when I saw it, I just kind of laughed. I said, I'm not a murderer or a rapist, any of that stuff. I'm a normal guy. So I just kind of blew it off. And, and I just thought to myself, well, you know, the theory's probably wrong. Turns out that, you know, it had to be that. And, uh, but it turns out the theory wasn't wrong, because other people after this found the same pattern in psychopaths. So it wasn't that. Uh, about, I, I, we were very busy uh, that year uh, looking at the genetics and the, and the scans uh, of schizophrenics and, and people with Alzheimer's. So we were really distracted. But about, within about six months, 2006, I got the first uh, of my genetics back. And the, the genetics, the alleles, the forms of the genes that I had, all lined up with high violence and high aggression, a low anxiety, and a kind of empathy that's consistent with, uh, with a psychopath. So now, you know, uh, I've, I've got the two <laughs> biological markers, uh, including ones in my own theory, and I still was pretty much in denial. Uh, about the same time, we're having a party. My mother's 97 now, and she's just full of it. She's cognitively in great shape. And uh, she, she, she says, your cousin gave me a book. You've got to read this. It's a historical book, and it's about your father's family. Now, her whole family's from Sicily, and she always got the business about being mafia. In fact, growing up, she was a bootlegger and all this stuff, and she rode a, 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 a dynamite truck to Lucky Luciano's place. But they were all good people. You know, they, they were... <laughs> So, so she was sick of that. And here was a book, and it was about the, the first killing of a mother by a son, matricide, in the American colonies. And, and it was my direct grandfather, OK? It was the Cornells. And it, but in that, uh, you know, one of my cousins is Ezra Cornell, who founded Cornell University. That's very nice, right? Kind of offset it. But also, because <laughs> hopefully, that was the idea. And uh, another cousin, though, was Lizzie Borden. Now, cousin Lizzie I got, got a lot of press. I tell you, she's innocent. So she, we, <laughs> we don't count Lizzie as one of the murderers in our family. Uh, but we also found, for example, that one of my cousins, one of our cousins is Jimmy Carter and Marilyn Monroe. And of course, we all have these kinds of connections with people. So, but it was fun finding this out. Again, part of the parlor game of it all. Now. It, it, but then it got, it got kind of worse. Now, ancestry is not genetics, right? But it's fun to do. But it turns out, on my father's side of the family, not only was that one whole line of, of murderers and bad actors, uh, well, there were three other lines of murderers. And one of them went back to these, uh, this group of Irish, uh, English kings who were, were the most savage of the, the English kings. And those are all direct grandfathers. And we had slave traders. Oh, they're a very charming family on that side. But there was also kind of a high percentage of ministers and nuns. So they were really holy people, really rats. And, and it, was, it was a funny family on that side. So anyway, I, I found that out. And, uh, and I, I got a call and it, by uh, the guy who had just put money into an adult stem cell company. And, uh, and he, he put you know, a few million dollars in. He goes, you know, give a TED talk and talk about the struggle to get adult stem cell biology accepted. And it never was. And we had findings in the mid-90s and, and, and had some findings in humans. And after 10 years, the New York Times, who was not the Nobel Committee, said our, you know, our results were like the most startling finds of the uh, decade of the brain. So I was going to talk about the kind of the struggle against the bias, some scientific bias where people just don't believe you.
People just didn't think there were adult stem cells in the brain and certainly couldn't activate them. We found out we could, and now the whole, uh, my life was dedicated to finding how to mobilize them to reverse Parkinson's and also chronic stroke. So we formed this company. He goes, talk about that, that whole struggle. I talked to the TED people. They went, yeah, that's OK, but can you make it sort of personal and funny? And here's the mistake I made. I said, well, I have this other story. you know." And I said, I don't know if anybody's going to think it was interesting, because they never really thought it was that interesting. And I told them, and they said, that's it. So I gave this talk. And in it, I had this uh, theory that I got from watching my mother weeding in our backyard. She was sitting on a three-legged stool. And I said, well, we have contributing to psychopathy these high vulnerability genes. And the other leg would be a certain brain pattern. And the third one was early abuse or abandonment. Now, I was somebody who never believed that environment meant anything. I was really into the genetics and behavior. It's the biological basis of it. So, uh, so I gave that talk. And in, in that, uh, that talk, uh, I know nothing about politics or the law uh, or business, but I found out something. I do know something about marketing. If you have a TED talk and the key words are psychopathic killer, you get a million hits really fast. <laughs> <laughs> now, here was, now, that was sort of OK. It was just sort of a cute, fun story. Then I went to Oslo. I was invited to give a talk with the ex-prime minister of Norway on bipolar disorder and the connections and the genetics of it and everything. So I gave it. With, he, he uh, gave a talk. He had kind of brought himself out as having that during his first term. And he got treated, and he came back and had a very successful second term. So it was kind of a heroic story, especially for a Norwegian to admit this. And uh, so I was giving a talk, and I had to use somebody's genetics. So I used, I put all my genetics and my brain pattern, and I listed all of my clinical conditions from birth onwards. You can't read that there, but there was, I went through this whole list. At the end of the talk, the, uh, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry was there. He says, you don't know this, but you're, you have bipolar disorder. It's just not recognized as such in the United States. He says, you have hypomania, and you don't feel depression, but he says, you're full bipolar. He says, and I also want to talk to you afterwards. So we met after the talk at the, uh, the president of the University of Oslo's house. And several psychiatrists and psychologists were there. And I, I talked to them for a couple hours. They said, you're, 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 you're uh, pretty close to being a full psychopath. <laughs> Now, that kind of slowed down my Cabernet drinking that night, because I'm, <laughs> you know, I had never taken it seriously. I had the biological data, but I just kind of blew it off. But these people didn't know me, but they knew the clinical and biological data, and these psychiatrists, and they talked to me, and they said, you got to check this out. So the first time I took it seriously, I went home, and I asked the question, I started asking questions to people, and when you ask this question, <laughs> be ready for some, uh, some answers. And I just basically said, tell me what you really think of me. Now, and I said, I won't get mad. I won't do anything. And I started with the psychiatrist who knew me for many years and who, had, you know, who knew my behaviors. And uh, then I went on to my family and very close friends. And they all said the same thing. They said, well, you're pretty much close to being a psychopath. We've been telling you for years. <laughs> I said, no, you said I was crazy. I said, you're not crazy. He said, but all these things, and they went through these specific behaviors. And when I saw them all there, it kind of hit me. Then I got you know, analyzed, psychoanalyzed, and all this stuff, and took the test. And I'm a, I'm a borderline. I'm not a full categorical psychopath. I'm what you call a pro-social psychopath. <laughs> Sounds nice. It's, it's also called a successful psychopath, which basically means you haven't been caught. So, so one reason you don't know me is because I've been hiding all these years, and you didn't quite know that. So anyway, to get back to this, I still didn't understand why I wasn't really much worse than I was, even though I have behaviors that are, are not so charming. And I, I have all the, these pro-social uh, symptoms and traits. And, and I looked at it, and it didn't make sense to me. And then when I was looking at it just a couple of years ago, I looked at some of the alleles. And one of them was a serotonin transporter. And I have these so-called warrior genes. I'm just loaded with them. But some of these, they're only warrior genes if you're abused or abandoned early in life, especially from, you know, from birth to the first few years. But it was found out in a monkey, another paper in humans, that if you're treated really in a nurturing environment, it erases some of the other negative characteristics. So this was really the first aha moment, because 
in my whole life, I was always treated like a golden child. You know, my, my our mother had our older brother, and they wanted a huge family, and then she went through five years of miscarriages, and then I showed up. So the very fact that I was alive meant I was special. You know, it was like a, a mistake, but I'll take it. And so, uh, and then there were another four years of miscarriages, uh, and then after that, uh, 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 my mother's uterus got it right, so she ended up with six kids, very boom, 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 quickly. But I was treated so well by uh, not only my family, but my extended family, and they knew when I was going through puberty, I was, I was in some trouble. I was going through some dark period. My, and in having, a, especially a matriarchy who could see into behavior and do something about it was great. So I think my mother told my teachers, watch this kid, make sure he keeps busy. And so I kept busy all the time, and, and that was it. And then, of course, you know, about 10 months ago, I got, I got contacted, and these literary agents said, you got to write a book on it, which I did, The Psychopath Inside, where I go through uh, some of the nasty things, uh, how um, my own uh, psychopathic behaviors and kind of the biology of it, the genetics of it, what's known about it. Okay, so in this, uh, in reflecting on this, the first thing was that, you know, I had always been in denial of the effective environment. And it turns out that uh, this was incorrect. Now, uh, if you look at the whole history of nature-nurture, which turns into genetics and epigenetics, ultimately, uh, in, in environment, uh, from the time of Plato and Socrates, it turns out uh, Plato was correct, okay? Socrates didn't quite have it. But there's this whole history of, of genetics, and, and a large part of it at the end, of course, includes Craig, and it would be great to hear what he's going to say. But in this, I never appreciated this interaction of, of genes and environment, and that's when the, the, the crow showed up. And, you know, if you're a scientist, you hate to be wrong, especially if you're narcissistic. I'm very narcissistic, and I had to admit uh, to all my colleagues I was wrong. So when you have to eat crow, and a crow this big, I, I didn't enjoy it at all, but I mean, I, I was caught in the bind there. So now, given this, I, I asked the question, what do I do about this personally? Now, I know that you can't do anything if you're born with the psychopathy or any of these personality disorders. There's no treatment. And, uh, but I said, I could do it, though. I can change. So what I started doing, first with my wife a couple of years ago, I started every interaction I would have with her, I stopped for a moment and said, what would a good guy do here? So it starts with, you know, who do you pour the wine for first? Who do you serve? Do you clean up? Simple things. But also, I'm the kind of person who, if there's like a family death, I'll, if I find a party, I'll be at the party. I mean, I'm a real rat. And, and so I stopped and, and I stopped and said, no, you got to do this other thing. But I found out a couple of things. First of all, that stopping and looking at this emotionally, you know, empathy, with some empathy, and it turns out I don't, do not have a very good empathy, emotional empathy. I have cognitive empathy, but not emotional empathy. And I found out that hundreds of times a day I was doing the most selfish thing possible. And it, but it slowed me down because I had to think of it, and I became less smart. You know, part of being a psychopathic is you don't care about other people. And everybody, usually when you interact with people, you're saying, am I going to hurt this person? Or somebody like me, I don't even think of it. So I appear smarter than I am. I may not appear too smart right now, but, you know, you appear smarter. And, and so psychopaths don't have to go through that inefficiency of looping into the limbic system. And so... <laughs> it's, it's sweet, isn't it? It's, and, you know, after a couple of months, she goes, what, what are you doing? What's going on? She thought it was a con. And she goes, I said, what do you mean? She says, well, your, your behavior's changed. Oh, you're nice. And, and then I started to do it with everybody else close to me, and they said the same thing. And they weren't talking to each other. But then they, and I, and I told my wife and I told my close friends, you, I said, this is not sincere. I'm just doing it because I think I can do it. <laughs> and, and I, and I was really being honest, you know? It was like, are you lying? You're being honest. But, you know. and, uh, and they said, no, just the fact that you're trying and you're doing this is enough. And I said, you don't care if I'm sincere? They go, no. I never understood this about people. They all just want to be treated well. Oh, <laughs> You know, it was just a big surprise to me. You're talking to a 14-year-old boy here, you know. And, and, and so the next thing is, what do you do professionally? So I got two of my close colleagues. Uh, in the back there is Fabio Machardi. He was, he's the first guy that discovered 
uh, associative mating, you know, that you, you end up marrying a family, basically. This is back in the 80s. It's a geneticist, epidemiologist, psychiatrist, and also Tom Stevenson, who raises, who's a fundraiser. And the three of us got together. And of course, when you get uh, three of you together, uh, you don't call yourself the three amigos or the three musketeers or what my wife called us, which I can't repeat here. Uh, you call yourself a, a global consortium, of course. <laughs> So we started this global consortium. <laughs> I mean, it's the only thing to do, right? And, and so what we started to do is, given this information, what can we do professionally? Now that we, we're starting, and a lot of people are starting to know this you know, research-wise, how epigenetics evinces behavior, and can it be changed? Well, so, well you, once you have early epigenetic changes early in life, you can't change them. So, but how can we convince belligerent countries, belligerent groups, that by creating neighborhoods that are in generation after generation of violence, it changes those kids? Because uh, they're seeing violence all the time, and you end up with a warrior culture, which sounds like a, you know, a brave world, but it really, they destroy themselves. So if we could convince them biologically and behaviorally that it's a bad thing to do, to have this, you know, generations of it, because they destroy themselves. Everybody's against war, right? But if you say you're going to destroy yourself with this. So that was the beginning idea. And we started to um, do some studies. Now, one of the things, uh, it got me to thinking about leadership. And, and so when I was thinking of all the psychopaths uh, in the world, of course, this idea came up through film and movies and through the, you know, the financial world and elsewhere that there was something about psychopathy and leadership. Now, I, I thought the first thing that uh, my recommendation to any company uh, would, or a group, and I work with the military, them too, that they take a, a, in the C-suite, they have a C-level person called the CPO. It's a very important, which of course is the chief psychopathic officer. Now, now that sounds, you know, it's tongue in cheek, and it's not cute to have a full categorical psychopath working with you. It's really bad. But there are traits associated with psychopathy that are interesting. And, if you take uh, one trait, and this is one of these pro-social traits called fearless dominance. And fearless dominance is, is a, a major psychopathic trait. And on the left is Teddy Roosevelt. You have JFK, FDR, Ronald Reagan. They all have a very high psychopathic trait called fearless dominance. It's pro-social. It's not the antisocial one. It's a pro-social one. Now, the thing about this, this is also associated by the voters as being leadership. So people have that charisma, they get the light around them when they walk into the room. That's fearless dominance, and it's what people want. It doesn't make you a good leader, but it really impresses people. So leadership at any level is this. And so, you know, in a way we have to accept some psychopathic traits as being very powerful. And, you know, you can look at, for example, uh, more recently, President Clinton, President Carter. Now, President Clinton, he's kind of in the middle. He doesn't have this full trade. He's in the middle, but it's thought to be, uh, have great leadership skills. And, and uh, Jimmy Carter is, has zero psychopathy, as it turns out. Now, he's got leadership skills, but zero psychopathy. So we're tending to have these less sort of pernicious people. Now, if you look at the Bushes, it turns out that George Bush uh, and Bill Clinton have at the same level of psychopathy and leadership. It's the same one. Uh, George Sr., also like Jimmy Carter, zero. And so uh, th this is a very interesting thing of how uh, psychopathy really integrates into the culture. If you look at empathy, here's another one. The different kinds of empathy, uh, one has to do with being in-group and out-group. Uh, people who are empathetic toward family and tribe and whole versus whole nation in the world. Uh, and then there are other people who just have this cognitive one. And there's the marker in my brain for cognitive empathy. I, I have very little emotional empathy. But I know what other people are th feeling. And so uh, the problem with psych psychopaths is they use that against you. Now, if you take a look, I, I looked at three of our, uh, my heroes, right? It's uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, Gandhi, and Mother Teresa. It turns out that they love the world. They love all the children of the world. They did tremendous things. But if you heard uh, Nelson Mandela's daughter talk at his memorial, she said he was a great man, but he probably didn't want to be his daughter. Uh, same thing with Gandhi. He was not very good with his own family. Mother Teresa, interpersonally, was a wonderful person, was a little prickly to, to, to be along with. So some of these 
traits are very conducive to leadership. But the, one of the points is, is that you, know, you don't have good and bad genes. And if we look at these traits of good and bad, you know, think of them like this. Some of these traits are good for the individual in a family. They're not good for the, for the whole species. Some which are great for the species are terrible for home life. And if you look at it that way, it's, you have to look at it in a complete species way. And so we started asking some questions. Uh, and just one, uh, in leaders in energy. You, without narcissism, who has got the, the energy to go 24-7 to be a president or a CEO? You have to be on all the time. And an average person just doesn't have it. Doesn't have that drive and, and, and take risks. Uh, we took two of many questions that we're now looking at. So we're looking at funding for these others, and, and we've also already started on some of these, and I'm almost done here, I see I'm out of time. Because um, we're really uh, concerned about uh, not only bullying, but street violence and home violence. And, and, and so what we did was, like, I, I went to the Sahara, and the idea was that nomads have very little war. And so if you took a group of living nomads, went in and tested them genetically, for example, with war genes, et cetera, but also interviewed all of them, both Bedouins and uh, Berbers, Arabic, non-Arabic uh, nomads, and uh, in this uh, found out that the, both of these, the Arabic and non-Arabic, were genetically very close to Sicilians. And in fact, the way they adjudicate problems is very similar to the way Sicilians do it. And they have a very stable society. They let people fight for a while, and then they got to get in front of the elders who say, you know, shut up, you did this, this. And so they have a very efficient way. What I never understood and appreciated was the effect of the physical, harsh physical environment. A harsh physical environment is very conducive to peace. And uh, this is why Burning Man should never be held anywhere other than that playa up in northern Nevada. If it was held in a, piece, in a very nice place, the people would be fighting all the time. But up there, you got to be good to each other. Now, another thing we're looking at right now is we're looking at uh, human skeletons and human DNA from 500,000 years ago to today. This guy right here we're looking at is 24,000 years ago. And he's, it's upper Paleolithic, and we have good DNA from him. We have a skull reconstructed, so we're reconstructing what his brain looked like. We're trying to match up the changing genetics th throughout the past 500,000 years with the brain, how the brain is changing, and the culture, the art that's found with them. For the tools. So we're trying to look at it kind of a transdisciplinary way to see the human trajectory. Now, one thing I said a few minutes ago was that you can't reverse epigenetics very easily. Uh, and, but it turns out Fabio Machardi uh, just published a paper this in the past month and a half that showed that you can. This is fantastic news, that you can go back and forth with gene expression and you can change the epigenetics, which means that we may be able to uncode un uh, psychopaths and other nasty people. Or people have been bullied. You know, that, that the whole uh, depressing cycle of that. So that was very good news. And I want to end with this, which is, here's the usual way we look at the, the human trajectory. That is, uh, we, we, we see this, this steady progression into modern man. But uh, we're headed, of course, toward a, a transhuman world that was already mentioned uh, uh, today. And, and that is the integration of, you know, of synthetic biology and, and digital uh, those sorts of interactions with our genome and our epigenome. And so that's being done, and it's inevitable, and it's probably a good thing, even though it's scary. So here is where we see uh, humans going. Uh, we went from handyman, homo habilis, to homo erectus, to homo sapien. That, there we are today. Neanderthals, we somehow outbred them. And, and uh, so they went extinct, but about, there's about 1% of Neanderthal DNA in each of you. But it's different DNA for all of you, so about 25% of Neanderthals is in us. So they became somewhat integrated with us. But now, what happens after that? Well, we have, uh, with the transhuman uh, changes, we're going to have a Homo uh, cyberneticus and a Homo optimus, who are then going to uh, interbreed to form Homo hybridus. And hybridus will then uh, be uh, integrated with the robotus uh, panis and, and to make ultimately homo machinists. Though this is going to be the brave new world that some people see. And of course, the people who are fighting this will become homo sapien laditis, and they will simply go away. This is a depressing future. <laughs> and, but if you're a scientist, it's very exciting. 
Okay, that's why it's it bums artists out, I know that. But if we, lastly, what does this have to do with the common thread? And in, in, in thinking about this, in order to really um, do all of this well, how do we address the threat of violence and abuse in global cultures and, and look at this uh, throughout the span of uh, human history, we need to sustain a stable and nurturing information society for good business and to do it well and ethically and morally, right? And so that's, uh, it's, it's very important for us to proceed in this way. Now, here we have a, a new formulation of what Neanderthal, this Neanderthal woman, a pregnant woman, uh, probably looked like. It's much different than we're used to seeing. A very elegant uh, redhead here in this part, but she's, her hair has died. Uh, and, and this is a reconstruction of what she looked like. And here in the middle is uh, some of us Neanderthal meeting just a thoroughly modern young gal. And where that interaction takes place, what is the common thread? Well, it turns out that Neanderthals did have culture, and a flute was found. So they, were, they played music. Uh, instead of talking so much, they probably used their mouth as a third hand. Now, I went out fishing, tuna fishing, three days ago, and everybody on there was a Neanderthal, because we have Thai hooks and everything with our mouth. And, but also, last month, found in Gibraltar, in the Neanderthal cave, was this symbol that was carved into the rock, the first real showing of Neanderthal art. Now, I don't know what it looks like to you, but to me, it looks like a hashtag. Now, <laughs> this first hashtag was 40,000 years ago by Neanderthal. What was he trying to tell us, the, the, this, this artist? Well, I, I, in, in finding this, the, the, weave, the weave of the common thread, I think the best uh, verbal description of it is, is by Goethe and Faust, which is, in truth, the subtle weave, web of thought is like the weaver's fabric wrought. When treadle moves a thousand lines, swift dart the shuttles to and fro. And seeing the threads together flow, a thousand knots, one stroke combines. So I've, in, the, in the talks I've heard, I've seen some of those single strokes that are really quite inspiring. So I think we're, we may see it here before the, uh, the conference is over with. So thank you.